down and listen to records Smell the cover, read all the verses Tell me about your favorites on vinyl and vision Hello and thank you for tuning in to the latest episode of Vinyl and Vision. This is episode 26. Uh, my very special guest tonight is Brendan Bell. Uh, Brendan is a extremely talented musician who's been around this uh, state for uh, over a couple decades now, I guess. He's probably most uh, well known for being a founding member and uh, writer for Groove of Small. Uh, he went on to do Johnny Classic and the Classic Johns, Ibu Gogo, uh, and he's currently working on a, his own solo project uh, simply entitled Bell, B-E-L-L-L, -L -L. it's three L's. Um, his first record is simply entitled One, and uh, right now you're probably listening to a little bit of a uh, sample track from that album called uh, Yeah Alright. Um, I've, uh, I've just been really excited and looking forward to speaking with Brendan for a while now. He's a friend of mine from way back in high school actually. So. Um, uh, just really fortunate to be able to reconnect with him on this episode and kind of just do some catching up, which is a lot of fun. So in addition to Brendan's uh, musical career and the, the bands that we talked about, um, I just want to mention the episode uh, tonight we did remotely, of course, because uh, of the quarantine and all, but um, using a lot of music, actually. Um, he actually reached out to, to Gavin Castleton, another member of Groove Small, for some uh, Andy Bugogo, for additional uh, video footage that I could possibly use, so I'm going to use a little bit of the footage that they sent to me, um, some live footage of theirs from, uh, I believe it was 2003, the Dead, the Dead Poets Tour with Sage Francis. Um, it's a really great video that they, they got from that show, from a show that there is on that tour from, uh, I believe it was somewhere in California. It's coming up right now, right after the, this little intro, so uh, stay tuned for that. Um, also used a little bit of video footage of uh, Ibu Google playing live. Uh, that's also mixed into the interview uh, in there somewhere. And I also used a little clip of um, this project Brendan was working on with Roman Rock. Um, they did a music video for a song called Free Verse. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a really great video. He did an awesome job on it. Um, and I used a little clip of that video also somewhere mixed in there into the, into the middle of the interview, and I hope that uh, Roman Rock doesn't come after me for it. Uh, if you listen to the song, you'll understand why. But I'm going to put a, a link to that, because um, that is also on YouTube, so you can kind of just go check out that video in its entirety, because it's, it's great. Just watch it. Um, as far as this show is concerned, just wanted to mention to everybody that uh, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Um, we have... Uh, Psychic Static is the company that I have started to produce this show and uh, produce other things that I'm working on. And we have a new website, PsychicStatic.net. Um, it's live and active right now. Um, it's still under construction. I'm still kind of uh, working on getting uh, some stuff up, to, uh, primarily the record store. Um, moving everything off of eBay and, and having it live in one place uh, off of that site so that uh, they don't gouge me for, you know, ridiculous feeds. But, um, so the record store will live there. It's going to take me some time to get all of my new um, inventory up there. But uh, I'm also going to make some merchandise very soon. We're working on some t-shirts and um, for both the podcast and the, the store, the production company, Psychic Static. And uh, also trying to work on some other things. Um, um, then other things will be coming soon. So uh, it's one of those things you might want to bookmark and just kind of keep on checking back on the website. And um, it's also it's a way to get in touch with me. You know, leave comments and uh, and uh, messages there, and and I'll get them. And uh, just like to say thank you, thank you to everyone for for watching, listening, and keep up. Keep on doing those things you do with the internet and like and subscribe and share and follow and comment and all those things you do. It's great. Thank you and enjoy the show. You guys like music? Yeah!
Good. So, uh, yeah, man. Um, geez. It's nice to see you. It's been yeah, a long time. Was, yeah. Like you, like most people from Cranston, you, you don't age. <laughs> I was uh, <laughs> contemplating shaving, and I was just like, oh, well, now I'll definitely look like I'm 17 if I do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There is something weird, man. There's a certain contingent of, like, Cranston folks that don't seem to age that that much. Yeah. I, I don't know what the, what it is. It was the water. I don't know, man. Whatever it was. Let's, <laughs> let's not ruin it for, for everybody. You know, Cranston will be uh, over overrun now by people looking for the Fountain of Youth. Yeah, looking for that youth. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's the Taco Bell on Reservoir Ave. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's so it? People, um, is that where you spent all your days back then? We we did actually uh, do a lot of cutting of class to go to Taco Bell during. We had like a library period. It was like a study hall or something. Yeah, we used to always go get lunch. Um, Mrs. Johnson Harris, do you remember her? She used to let us go. She was the librarian. She lived in my oh. neighborhood at one point and walked her cat on a leash. <laughs> She's one of those types, huh? Yeah. yeah. My wife, re- my wife does that, so I'm not really. I'm not really uh, slamming that. Yeah, yeah. She she likes to take them out on the leash every when they can. Like sometimes they don't like it. They try to yeah, get out. I don't, I don't know if this dude would, would go for it. Um, I'd like to try though. Go for it. Yeah, he yeah. seems to enjoy. I mean, he stares out the window all day, so he seems like he wants to get out. But oh, he wants to get out for sure. Just yeah. maybe not on a leash. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, yeah. For sure. Cool, man. So I feel like we have like a lot to get into, and uh, yeah, we, we already had like such a long talk just a few days ago, and we, we already t- like kind of discussed so much. Um, yeah. I don't really have a lot to say about the record that you chose, because um, not not because I don't like it. I think it's a great record. Yeah. I just um, there was really a lot like not a lot of uh, information about it, like good and like useful facts about it. Yeah, it has kind of like a mystery quality to it. There's not a lot, even I've looked into trying to find more information about like how it was constructed at different times in my life. And there really, yeah, there really isn't that much out there, Yeah, um, which kind of makes it more interesting to me. Yeah. I mean, so it's, it's definitely heralded as one of like the most, uh, probably the, one of the most influential records on hip hop, uh, from the nineties. Yeah, uh, definitely like, uh, ethereal instrumental hip hop kind of like burgeoning on electronic music um, right definitely probably like the quintessential like quote-unquote trip-hop album i guess right right kind of a yeah. birth from trip-hop i guess especially being from uh, moax right that was the label it was on yeah, moax was like a british kind of like fledgling hip-hop uh label i think they started as like a Pez label and then like tried to get a little more into the hip-hop world hmm. um but yeah, I mean, there was stuff before it that was trip hop, and this kind of like merged it more with like traditional hip hop in a different way. Yeah, yeah. Um, being that it was like completely comprised of samples. Right. Um, you know, that's you know, that's the other big fact. Yeah, that's a yeah, right. It's a pretty big feat, especially when you listen to it. Like, you, there's a lot of stuff that you're like, really, like, all of this is put together from just samples. But right. Well, I mean, it's not. I don't think that it, it it's hard to 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 fathom because I mean sampling for, you know is just basically taking little pieces of so, you know recorded music already right and then just kind of like reworking it into to some different type of music you know, for sure. different style or another just another different composition altogether. Yeah, I think it gets more impressive when you start combining like ten albums or something in one two minute part or stuff you know yeah. pieces pieces from that. And it's sounding like a cohesive piece of music, you know? Right, right. But yeah. he came more of like a hip-hop background, which is different than, I think, some of the some of the other artists in that genre of the time. You know? Yeah. I think he was more firmly in, like, making beats for rappers, you know, as opposed to making this, like, other mood music or whatever. And then right. he just ended up doing that, you know? Yeah. So do do you know a lot about his history? Like, or have you been a big fan for a long time? Or, um, I think I mentioned it to you before that like this is really my only DJ Shadow kind of thing. Like, this is the only record I really ever got into by by him. And it's not because I don't I have listened to other ones. It's not that I don't enjoy them. Hmm. It's just that like this one, this was enough. <laughs> it was like yeah. he did 
he kind of did what he does at his best almost and i and i it's kind of mean of me to not care i guess about anything else but this this one does it for me and i, I kind of feel like i don't need anymore right it's, as an artist that's a horrible thing to say because i would never want someone to be like oh yeah this dude made one record in 1996 and that's all i never ever need to hear right uh, well, a lot of people would probably agree with you. So, I mean, it's not like it's... And, and I think that uh, from what I've heard of him say himself, uh, it seems like that's a, that's a widely, um, like, generalization that happens for him. Like, um, most people feel like that record is probably the only record really worth right. listening to as well. And uh, yeah. so I'm, I'm sure that hurts his feelings a little bit too, but... Yeah, no, I think it took him a while. Like, I, I've read some interviews with him and I feel like he did kind of have a chip on his shoulder about that for a while and then kind of like eased into it you know we get wiser as we get older yeah he was appreciative of the fact that this was this hit so hard for so many people right you know and he still has a viable career so it's you know it's fine yeah for sure uh, but as far as like his background i mean i know he's from the bay area i don't really know that that much else yeah oh huh. yeah um not worth not too much worth getting into really i mean like uh, yeah. so I, I did hear some interviews with him where um he kind of described like how he first uh met his uh, longtime visual partner, I think it was, the guy from Meat Beat Manifesto. I forget oh. his name, Jack something? I don't know much about that collaboration. Yeah, um, but that was like, you know, back before he really started doing anything serious and before probably this first record. Right. But um, yeah, like I said, not not too much really that I really felt compelled about that I was just like, yeah, this is totally interesting, we gotta make, make sure to mention this. But. Uh, <laughs> I told you I could have picked like a million albums. No, no, but but I I like that. I mean, I like that you chose this record because, I, f frankly, I mean, I haven't I haven't really spoken to you in so long that I just yeah. kind of became more obsessed with the idea of like, oh, well, what the fuck is Brendan doing? Because, like, I genuinely have been kind of interested in, in like kind of seeing what you've been up to, um, you know. So because we we knew each other back in high school uh, when you were first in Groove of Small when you first started up that band. And, uh, but then from there, let's do a quick recap. You, uh, you got, you got into, um, I guess it was Johnny classic and the classic Johns first. Um, yeah, group of small was like thing from, for about 10 years, um, from high school to about 2005 is kind of when it really dissolved. Um, on our last proper tour, I think it was, we were opening up, that, uh, it wasn't our last tour, but our last like big or we were opening up for Sage Francis. We were his backup band and his uh, opening band. Oh, yeah. So it was really, like, intense tour every night, you know. There was a built-in crowd and audience, which was really cool, and it mm. was really great to kind of be in a backup band. It was really fun to not have to be center of attention, just kind of, like, backing up someone who was the center of attention, which was a good experience. But during that tour, I had a, this Game Boy with me, um... And I had bought this cartridge. It was like it's called Nano Loop 2.0 at the time. That's probably a 3.100. I don't know. Um, but it was in uh, this guy in Germany kind of like hacked into a cartridge so that you were it it, it tapped into this actual sound chip within the Game Boy. Hmm. So you could manipulate the actual sounds like from the sound chip, and you could create all your own sounds. And then you could it had like a 16 bar sequencer and okay. like in the four tracks 16 bars and you could kind of create these loops and then within that there was like this kind of a grid of i don't know 60 or so like loops and you could kind of like then you had to play it with the uh buttons and stuff to kind of like compose it as you were going right so on that tour that's like how i was keeping occupied i was just like making this weird game boy music huh and then when I, I had a job at a liquor store and uh kind of working all day at a liquor store on this thing. and then kind of fleshed it out eventually with, with guitars and vocals and like live instruments to kind of make this strange hybrid of, of Nintendo pop music. Yeah. It's pretty good. Okay. I'm not a big fan of the IPAs, but... I wasn't either, but uh, for some reason lately I've been drinking them. I was kind of like an IPA truther. I was always telling people like, your IPA is garbage, because like, everyone was so about it. But... Uh, yeah. yeah, lately I've been into it. I don't know why. Okay. It's changed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I revisit things constantly as I get older, so just to kind of make sure, is this like, okay, am I am I old enough for this now? Am I am I ready so, for this? Sometimes your body will surprise you. 
Yeah, no, it has for sure. That's why I tell um, my kids. So. So you were saying how um, you were explaining how you got the sounds for uh, Johnny Classic. Right. So, yeah, I mean, basically, I we, I called it Game Boy Pop because it was all composed on a Game Boy, and fleshed out in a. I was really trying to write like a pop record in what what my way, you know, would mm. be. Um, there's some successes on it, you know. It's a, overall, it's a very strange sounding record, um, but it was the first thing I ever did from start to finish, like by myself musically. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's cool. Well, I still have cases of it in the basement. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. When I was uh, when I listened to your your uh, interview with JJ, and he mentioned that thing about like bringing boxes of 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 stuff to Salvation Army or whatever goodwill like around the country and that it's funny because I had that exact idea when I moved into this house I had all these boxes of this CD I'm like I'm never going to do anything with this I should just be taking it yeah. to every place that takes free shit I'm just right. talking <clears throat> yeah you know I thought about that when he said it it was just like you know what you don't really have to go across the country and like donate them because they just right. do that anyway they just like take inventory and then they ship it out to all their different yeah. stores for sure but um, yeah you could do that I think I should do that because you never know. Someone might end up with it and love it. Yeah, a, a lot. I know that a lot of our old inventory end, ended up there because I remember oh, yeah. seeing some like on on like Goodwill or or Salvation Army shelves. I was like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, you always find stuff, man. Um, but yeah, uh, that was right around. Evil Go Go kind of started right around the same time as Johnny Classic. No, oh, really. Um, 2005, 2006. It was like both those things kind of happened as Grimace Vault was dying. It's like we were all kind of finding other places to put our energies into. And Evil Go Go started basically just as an offshoot of Grimace Vault. Like it was with two other two guys from the band. Um, oh, okay. Justin and Gavin, a uh, bass player and keyboard player. And we just kind of started playing on our own. Right. I don't even remember how that happened. but hmm. So, yeah, Evil Go Go was the next, next project. I mean, that was probably like my favorite music project. It was fun. It was really yeah. fun. Yeah, Good I mean, stuff. I told you how I kind of just like accidentally came across it. I had no idea you guys were even doing that. And right. it just blew me away because I, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't even know you were playing. I just showed up at the show that you were playing at. And I was just like, yeah, I know those guys. What the fuck? Like, what are they doing? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that's a, that was a reaction we got from a lot of people. Yeah. It was kind of a ballistic band that would just kind of walk on stage and hit you over the head in a very bizarre way. Um, right. And it would surprise, would surprise a lot of people, just kind of like the ideas and like the energy and kind of some of the dexterity of the music. Hmm. Um, yeah, it caught a lot of people off guard, I think. Yeah, well, you know what's funny is that like, like I loved it immediately. And like the, the for my first initial thought was just like, this sounds like, all, like prog rock. It sounds like straight up prog rock. It like, definitely like, was like in. I mean, those were the seeds of it for sure. It was yeah. like frog rock, um, zombie movies, and um, like eighties love ballads. It, it, those were kind of like the yeah. ideas behind it. It was like all the movies we grew up with as kids were all being referenced the whole time. That's pretty much all. 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 We, we weren't really referencing music. We were like referencing movies and cartoons all the time. So it was like we were. We weren't. We weren't like. Oh, this has to sound like this. It was like. This has to sound like this looks, you know what I mean? Like right. this has to sound like a guy falling out of a plane into the water, and then being eaten by a shark, and then the shark. You know, this whole we had all these weird scenes playing out as we were writing music, oh, okay. which made it a little more fun to reference things other than music with music. Mm -hmm. So when I thought it was prog rock, now it's actually not too far from from 
some of Grubus Malt's like influences too, because like listening back to the to the old catalog of Grubus Malt stuff, I was just like, yeah, this has got a lot of prog rock in it too. It's just not uh, like that kind of heavier, harder edge that that yeah. something like Ibu Gogo was more like, you know? Yeah, I think we were definitely at some point got turned on. Grubus Malt was kind of weird. It's like we changed our influences so much. We were just always looking for some new thing, and it just because we were all listening to a million things all the time and we kind of worked as a democracy, it was kind of like a failed experiment all the time. Like we, it, that, I'm not saying we never did anything good. It's yeah. it just that it, it was a struggle because everyone had their say and the final product ended up being this kind of amalgam of all this, uh, everyone's taste all at once. So mm-hmm. it was kind of like, um, we needed a leader, I think is what yeah. it was. It, but we refused to have a leader, you know? Right. right. It was almost, it's like, it's like when people try and pass a bill in, 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 in Congress or whatever, and it starts off with good intentions and then everyone puts their stamp on it until it's not at all what the original intention was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I think that that worked for you guys. I mean, cause yeah. the music was definitely, um, uh, eclectic for sure. And, and I thought that, I thought actually from, a, from an outsider's perspective, that's what you guys were going for. I, th- I think it kind of was, I mean, we were, we, Mr. Bungle was definitely like a huge influence on us in the beginning. I can do that forever, you know, and that and that kind of style of like, oh, it's ska, oh, it's funk, oh, it's metal, you know, like just that kind of like changing all the time or changing right. with the, you know, one song a million times. Right. That's definitely there to a lesser extent, maybe in our music, but um, yeah, we did some good stuff. We just we were so too young to really like figure out how to harness like what we were good at. I think is the problem. Hmm. Yeah. We were given a lot of opportunities, and like at each opportunity, we looked at you in the face, and we're just like, we know better, you know. Uh, which is, you know, that's what young people do. Some, some more than others. Yeah. Well, it's uh, funny. Uh, it's funny to hear you say that because I, I always felt like your music, uh, even in Groove Small, even like the first recordings you did, were were so mature. I mean, you know, from my perspective, I was like, I feel like my band the the superheroes that were coming up around the same time that you guys were starting was a lot more of just like this kind of thrown together haphazard punk rock thing yeah and i didn't think i didn't think of it as much that that way in fact when i rem- i remember hearing your first cd and being like wow this sounds like a real cd whereas on my our music i always thought it sounded like something else i don't know it's oh like, really it, yeah it's weird i had the I, I had the completely different impression i always thought ours sounded very immature and like kind of like reflective of our age and then i would hear like a band like yours and i'd be like they, they really have it together oh weird <laughs> so it's yeah. just that whole the grass is always greener on the other side thing because yeah i don't know yeah I, don't I mean i don't think i could ever listen to any recording i've ever done and think and like really hear it and be like this is a great recording this sounds awesome this sounds yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's it is really hard man it's like looking in the mirror and being like i look great today you know yeah people just don't do it <laughs> I, I'm certainly not doing that today, but uh, you look great today. Thanks, man. Um, so yeah, that's out. That's just really funny to hear, man. It's just so so weird because like you know we had s- such a, a weird tumultuous like relationship as kids, like you know doing those things, gro- growing those two bands together at the same time, and like being in the same space as you said like the last time we talked. Um, you know, I um, think that's a lot of it. Yeah, it's just you're you're fighting for this space. You know, right. you know, you, you gotta have, you gotta be number one in, in the high school band circuit. Yeah, yeah. I can't even remember who won the battle of the bands. Do you remember that? We did, but we cheated. How uh, do you mean you cheated? We, <laughs> well, we hooked up with with uh, with the Golden Tongues, who were like Roman Rock and um, and uh, Roy Cabrera and all those dudes. So we like played half of our songs and then we were the backup band for like a, a hip hop group. So we were like two bands. So oh, we okay. kind of monopolized the audience by, by, by bringing our audience and their audience together to vote for, for one, one thing. So it's oh. kind of cheating. Well, I don't know. Okay. If you say so, I don't really care, but I didn't realize that either. I didn't realize that, uh, that that was going on. And I didn't realize Roman rock was part of that group, like the golden tongues. Mm. Oh, yeah. Man, yeah, I, I did not pay attention in my youth. I really didn't. That's all right. I don't. I remember like really specific things, and then I don't remember entire years. You know. Yeah. Um, I do remember having mono at the Battle of the Bands. Um, that was fun. Oh yeah. Really? That, 
getting over mono, and for some reason, like, my parents were like, yeah, it's cool, go, go play some Battle of Beds uh, with a fever. Yeah. Worked huh. out, though, it got that, like, $25 check. There you go. All worth it. Yeah, yeah, totally. So now, you were saying how um, you felt like Grubus Malt was kind of more democratic, and so you guys didn't really have a leader. Um, what, uh, I, I was... I would have assumed that you and Gavin were kind of the leaders because you were the front guys. You were the, the singers of the band. Uh, yeah. I mean, not really. We, we were the front people, so I guess we had we occupied more more of that space on stage. Like visually, we were the leaders. We were out front, but I, it was really there. Really, was no leader. If anyone was the leader, it would have been Gavin, but just because he was more on top of things and like kind of managing some stuff behind the scenes. Uh, you know, he had more drive than a, a lot of the other mm. members. But musically, I think he like would have maybe liked to be more of the leader, or, or all of us maybe would have liked to be more of the leader, but was willing just to operate within that framework where everyone had a say. Yeah. He, but we, I mean, we wrote all our lyrics and stuff. So, if, but you know, I, I don't consider that being like a, a leader. Like, I, that's one thing I've never understood is like how sometimes people who, who write the lyrics get called the song. They wrote the song, or like. Do you know what I mean? Like the yeah. lyric writer, the songwriter. Right. Where, like, for me, that's almost the last, the last, last thing. Right. Unless you're like Leonard Cohen or something, you know. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. it's a general perspective where, like, the majority of music listeners, like the like the let's just call them like the uneducated music listeners, the mainstream music listeners, let's say. Yeah. Um, they focus on lyrics. Lyrics are a, a massive. Right. I think. Yeah, I think it's a very important part to, to listeners. Uh, me, not so much. I actually really don't care for lyrics that much. Um, I like more of how they sound with the music. Yeah. Um, but uh, but it, it definitely it does kind of create a, a different uh, perspective, I think, from from a, from an audience. Uh, you know, the audience perspective, it's it's just different that way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, so because that was one of the things I wanted to ask you about was that uh, being the front man, you and Gavin being the front man of Groove Small, and I would lead to, be led to believe that that was make you guys like the leaders of the band um with the uh, projects that you kind of went on to went on to, to to create um you kind of stepped away from being the front person or being or, or having lyrics almost at all in some of your projects yeah i mean now especially um johnny classic you know that was still there was vocals on almost on 90 percent of those songs and right. you know still doing it there evil go go then yeah switch the instrumental and then this, what everything I'm doing now is is like most I'm there. I sing a little bit here and there, but it's not lyric based much, you know. Right. Like the, like the last that last album had, you know, one verse that was like four lines or something on it, you know. And it does mm -hmm. it still operates more as like music than than uh, vocals to me. Right. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't know why that is. I guess that I enjoy seeing it. I, I kind of have ideas that, that I would still like to do it, you know, or, or even just like pick a, pick up a guitar and like write songs that way and record them that way. Mm -hmm. But every time I've tried to operate in that way, it just doesn't seem to work for me. I don't, I don't know why. And mm -hmm. I really have nothing to say right now. I haven't for years. Like every, I write lyrics, they just don't seem to mean anything to me. So I'm like, well, why am I doing this? When mm -hmm. I can make music that's instrumental and say everything I want to that way, you know? Right. Or at least capture the vibe that I want to capture. Yeah, well, that was uh, something I was thinking about too. Is this like, um, you know, I don't really know a lot about your background. So what, what was like the first uh, musical instrument you you took up? Like, what was your first uh, musical experience like? Um, it would have been piano, I guess, when I was a kid. We all, everyone in my family, kind of took piano lessons, um, and I enjoyed it. But I, I, like, refused to read music. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It into my whole life. I, can't do it and it started at a young age and every time i've ever tried since i just my brain won't take it in. i don't know why it's like i just want to make the, the music like i don't want to see it right uh and it's very detrimental to someone who has ideas you know it makes it much harder to express them or even to learn more about theory and stuff uh, so yeah i took a uh, piano lessons when i was a kid refused to learn uh read music so Basically, once I, I played everything by ear and just pretended to read music for years. And then once you start getting into more complex 
music, you, you can't do that anymore. You know what I mean? You can right. start playing Bach or something, and then, like, after the first few bars, like, the teacher realizes that you aren't reading the page. Right, right. Uh, so I kind of, like, gave it up in shame, I guess. You hmm. know? So then uh, where did you move on from piano when you, when you lost interest in that? Uh, nothing for a while, and then drums eventually... But it's the same thing, I, weren't, I, w I wouldn't learn, like, the theory behind it, and I just kind of, like, wanted to bang around on shit. Right. And I didn't have a drum set, so it made it even harder. Um, so drums were kind of put aside um, until I was hanging around people who actually had drum sets, and then I would just, like, take every opportunity I could to kind of, like, mess around with their kit. So I kind of taught myself, again, to play drums over the years. Um, just on other people's gear, you know, right. until I could find, I got my first personal drum set when I was 26, 25, when we were starting Evil Go Go. I needed my own kit. Right. Um, yeah. When you become, then, when you become uh, the drummer, you kind of need your own set. Yeah. Yeah. You, you finally need your own kit. You can't play on everyone else's. Um, but along the way, I, you know, I, I also learned guitar and bass to some degree. I'd say that bass and drums are like my main instruments. They're the ones I play the most. Um, but also, you know, I play guitar and, uh, keys and whatever I can, I can get a sound out of whatever. Mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so you're definitely more of a, uh, self-taught and kind of learn by ear. You just, yeah, it's, it's all by ear for me. It's a, I hate it and I love it. You know, I think it's, a, I think I'm good at it. I think I have a good skill there. Like I think I'm good at listening, right. but, um, I'm missing out on a whole other side of the music world, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, me too. I mean, I don't know how to read and yeah. I don't plan on ever figuring it out at this point. Yeah. It's, I still want to, I keep telling myself like, maybe I should just like take piano lessons, like adult piano lessons. Like when I hear someone play like a beautiful piece of music and I know I can never do it until I learn to read music, I get really jealous. Like I'm like, I want to do that. Maybe in my old age. I don't know. Hmm, maybe, maybe you'll just get, get fed up again and be like, ah, oh, fuck this. I don't want to do it. <laughs> that's probably what would happen especially when you could just like yeah yeah maybe listen to a great piece of music and not have to play it right uh, but yeah definitely definitely hanging around people who were way better musicians and way more learned musicians than me uh, helps a lot you know you pick up stuff from from your friends um, that helps you figure things out you know and even just watching someone who's way better at music than you are Right. Like in Evil Go Go, I mean, I was playing with like two serious like musicians. Like I was just playing it by ear. Like I'm a drummer, you know, um, and I have some skills, but they're my own skills, and they're, they're not really necessarily the normal skills you need. And um, I'm playing with Gavin and Justin, who are just like these amazing taught musicians. Yeah. And, you know, it made me way better at at music. You know, just to be playing with those guys. Right. So I always think that's important. That's why I never practice by myself. I only practice with other people or play with other people. I don't feel like I gain anything when I when I practice music by myself. Although mm -hmm. you probably do. I just personally don't do it. Right. Right. No, I hear you. It, it's it's just not as um, it's not as uh, kind of lucrative. It doesn't feel as good to to, yeah. to not have anyone to bounce an idea off of or kind of like you know have someone to kind of give some feedback or, or just work with and throw out some ideas and mess right. around like that. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's it, some people, it's like being an athlete or whatever, like to be like a great baseball player, you have to hit a ball 4,000 times in a row every morning. You know what I mean? Right. But like, I don't want to sit down at a drum set and just like do like little fills with my hands for four hours, you know, to get the right motion so I can do it like whenever I want. It just doesn't interest me. It's awesome when people can do it. Uh, I kind of wish I had that part of me like working, but I'd rather just like not play for a year than play for an hour with someone and like have created like a little, little piece of music. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't, I don't, I don't blame you for that. That sounds normal. No, the, uh, one of the things I, I want to kind of get into with you for a little bit before we start uh, getting into the album was uh, what was your musical experience like growing up? Like, what was the first uh, album you ever bought? Huh. Um, first album I bought for myself would probably be, uh, or bought or asked for, would probably be Thriller. 
by Michael Jackson. Oh, yeah. And then probably Peter Gabriel's So, which would be right after that. Oh, cool. And I think that Peter Gabriel's So actually affected me way more than Thriller. Um, it's a heavy album, and it's really awesome musically. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. With me. Are you familiar huh. with it? Uh, I listened to it recently. Uh, I actually yeah. had a copy of it on vinyl, so uh, yeah. kind of just listened to it. Um, that one has basically all of his major hits it's from the big '80s hits. Yes, yeah. like Sledgehammer and um, yeah. Big Time. Yeah, um, and uh, In Your Eyes, I think, is on there. Red Rain. It, but in between all those hits are these like crazy kind of like they are almost prog rock. I mean, almost Brian Noe kind of like yeah, really cool music. Right. Um, with a pop sensibility, of course, but the amazing production, amazing musicianship. Um, so yeah, those, I think those were probably the first two. But I lived in like a house where, you know, music was was big. It was my dad was really into music. My sisters, I have two older sisters who were very into music. Um, so I was like lucky in that respect, where we had all the Beatles albums on record. My dad had all the Dylan albums on record. And then my sisters had all the Cure albums and all the R.E.M. albums, you know? Yeah. So that stuff was always around, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so did you always have an affinity for vinyl because of growing up that way? Or did you just kind of, did you kind of get into it later? To a degree, um, I've always had records of some sort like I was never a huge collector I just always had them because I would go to Salvation Army and I'd be like oh this looks cool or whatever or I had some from when I was a kid or I would have some hand me, hand me down records or whatever yeah um, but we, we definitely growing up you know when I was real little that's what we had we had records and then it was tapes I was probably tapes or like cassettes are probably my big medium not now but growing up I mean that's what I listened to like yeah. I, I I burned through like 10 tape Walkmans every year, you know, mm -hmm. just like 24 hours a day, <laughs> like rewinding tapes and killing each, each Walkman. Um, yeah. Uh, I think this the DJ Shadow record I probably bought on cassette, but I think the first copy I had was cassette. Oh, okay. Even though it came out on CD, I still chose to buy cassettes because um, every car I ever had had a cassette player, so I didn't, I didn't want to have to go through the, like, burning process or whatever. Dumping. Process. Right. I wanted to leave the store and have it pop it in the, in the deck. Right. Hmm. But yeah, I definitely always had records. And I think as a, more of an adult, I started like kind of filling out the collection. Or it, when, once I started sampling records too, um, you know, then it becomes a whole other thing. Because you're not only li looking for li music to listen to, but you're look looking for something that might have interesting sounds on it, you know? Right. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's get into the record from there because um, that's a very uh, interesting like way of creating music that I am not familiar with at all. Like the whole sampling thing. Um, now I listened to your latest record, um, which is simply entitled uh, One and by Bell, which is with three L's. B e l l l. It was like a I had to add an L to get the SoundCloud page originally, like ten oh. years ago. Yeah, yeah. And I'm also late, too lazy to like think of clever names anymore, so I figured it's my name with an extra L, and the first album's name is one, and the second album's name will be two. Yeah. So keeping it simple. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, um, yeah. so I, I, I mean, it's a great record though. It sounds good. And comparing the two of them together, because like after I asked you what record you wanted to feature, and then you saying DJ Shadows uh, introducing. Um, you know, obviously I listen to that record and then I listen to your newest record. I was just like, oh yeah, these, these kind of go hand in hand. Like they're, they're very similar. I can see yeah. a pretty clear kind of through line of inspiration from that. But, um, but this being your first kind of like major, um, I don't know, uh, I, I, I guess major electronic record, would you call it that? Or who is it still just hip hop? Yeah, I mean... It is, for the most part, like at its heart, it's an electronic music album. Um, yeah. There's a lot of live instrumentation on it. Um, okay. But some of it is me sampling myself, and some of it is just me playing live through, you know. But at its heart, it's a sample-based record. Okay. It's just like, I start there, you know. I start. I always start with samples, and then by the end, maybe it, the song is 20% samples, but it started there, you know. Right. 
um, I just it's a great place to start for me is to just kind of like find some sounds that you get an inspiration from or like you, you start you start hearing a melody that could go over it you know and mm -hmm. you didn't really have to like sit around playing something forever you just kind of like created something out of something else you know mm. I, yeah I, something about that I really like well, that's actually kind of becoming more intriguing to me as I'm getting older and as I'm kind of like becoming more frustrated with like trying to find a band and stuff. And it's like, this is actually sounds like a great way to try to try to try to make some music is, yeah. you know, just find stuff that sounds kind of interesting and then find out how to kind of like manipulate it and yeah. rework it maybe, you know, with extra beats or different beats and stuff and so forth. And yeah, I mean, the tools are, are infinite now too for it. I mean, that's one of, that's another thing about the DJ Shadow record is that it was, you know, it was all made on an MPC. Like, there was no computer or anything. And it's, an MPC is just basically like a, a sampler sequencer, but it's got a, a grid of, like, 16 pads. Okay. And you just you play music into it, and you can chop it up like this on the, on the pads. And then you can manipulate, like, what's on the pads and stuff. Hmm. Um, but it, it just is a very interesting way to make hip-hop. He does it in a different way. A lot of times, like, a hip-hop producer will... Will, ha will sample it in it so it's like on beat you're sampling it like this so then you can kind of reconstruct music um form but kind of at the same in the basic form it came in yeah i don't know if that makes any sense yeah well from interviews i heard with him like um i heard him actually like breaking apart some of his newer music um but like kind of showing the original sample and yeah. like kind of playing that, and so now you hear that. Now this is me without knowing the song. So he's just right. basically playing the sample. He's just like, when I first heard this, this is kind of what I wanted to use. This was the base for me to kind of draw from initially, and then, you know, plugging it into, I guess, now he uses computers to kind of help compress well, and or... clean up files and stuff like that. Um, and then kind of build from there, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. So I don't know, it's a very interesting process. I just, it, it yeah. definitely is intriguing to me at this point, so. Well, yeah, and as a record collector, it's, it's really interesting as well. Like it, that might interest you even more because part of what I really enjoy about sampling is um, once you kind of get into it, you're looking for samples. You're also kind of like interested in what other people are doing, so you're looking at their music and you're trying to figure out where they got their sounds. So right. it opens up this whole other world of music that you probably wouldn't just stumble upon, like talking to your friends or whatever. You know, a lot of it's obscure stuff, um, rare stuff, stuff from other countries. Hmm. Uh, um, so it's just wild. Like the, you, it's like a, just a never-ending maze of like connections you can make once you start sampling or looking at other people's samples. You know what I mean? Right. When you're looking for samples, like I got the record store and anything, any record in the store. Like it's not like I'm looking for the first edition of of Tom Waits. You know what I mean? I'm. You could just go in there, and any record in the store now could be gold because it could it could have like two seconds of a sound that that you can turn into something great. You know. Right. So it makes music for me. It made it made looking for music or, or or listening to new music more exciting than it had been in a long time. Um, hmm. Cool. All yeah. right. Well, let's get. In. I, it, yeah, this record was a big part of that. Absolutely. I can. I can tell. Um, yeah. I have. I have a record, but I can't play it through my phone. Hey, do me a favor while you have that record out. Can I see, like, the label of the vinyl? Yeah. You want to see what edition it is? I want to see if I can kind of pinpoint just by the look of it. Cause... It's got the original Moax sticker on it. So... Okay. And when did you get that? Well, I got it used. Okay. But I don't. It's not like I didn't get it in 1996. It's pretty scratched up. Hmm. Uh, based on the, um, the label, does it say, uh, like made in the UK or Europe? So yeah, uh, that it could just be, um, like it could still be, it could still be from 96 cause there were a couple of pressings from the U S. Um, yeah, but it, make, it makes sense that they would start in the UK and see how it went. Cause it, it was, I remember there being some buzz about this record, like before it came out. Um, yeah, but it certainly wasn't supposed to be like the hit it became i guess underground hit right um i think i actually bought it the day it came out oh yeah on tape yeah. you mean yeah oh okay um i was in new york um uh, i went to right after high school i went to school i went to art school at parsons but only for a semester and it was like i went there for three months and it was like 
probably the most informative three months of my entire life. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, oh yeah. It, it it switched on so many things in my brain um, that I I just never like kind of forgot certain things. Um, and I think uh, yeah, I think I I knew like DJ Crush, and I might have known who DJ Shadow was because of some of his early singles. I think the guy was kind of DJing in Groove Vault at the time when we had a DJ. Uh, I think he had one of the early Moax singles. So okay. I think I, I had heard like, or the DJ Crush split record with it was DJ Crush, DJ Shadow, like split record. Yeah. So I knew who it was, and I knew I had read like some articles about like how this record was going to like be really good, blah, 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 you know. Hmm. Uh, so I was anticipating it, and I did buy it like right when it came out in New York on tape. Oh, okay. Cool, man. So, uh, what are you, let's see, um, so Best Foot Forward is the first track, and it's just basically intro track, just kind of like yeah. weird sampling, scratching happening. Yeah, I think that's him kind of like knowing that his his background was in hip-hop, but that he knew the record was going to be something a little different, and mm -hmm. so he like establishes himself as like a real hip-hop DJ at first. That's the impression I always got from it. It's like, mm -hmm. here, I, I'm not just like some phony, like I can scratch, I can do all this shit. And now I'm gonna blow your mind with this uh, this other stuff, you know, this movie yeah. stuff. Right. Uh, so yeah, it is kind of just a. I, I actually really like how this record starts with just kind of like the traditional hip hop scratching thing, and then the sample of like the guy talking about music, and then it gets into that like super soundtracky uh, piano part, and then the really heavy drums. Right. Uh, yeah. Um. So that would probably be building steam with a grain of salt. Building yeah, building steam is uh the first real track right like melodramatic almost there's a lot of that on this record yeah no it's very uh, exorcist like you know it's kind of got yeah. that like uh, mike oldfield or what's his name i was kind of yeah yeah oh, oh the guy who wrote, um, uh yeah what is that old oldenfield is that the guy's name fuck i can't remember his, i've been saying his name all day today like uh <laughs> but yeah yeah like that. yeah or like the yeah the halloween theme song like a uh, tubular bells so, right so i forget yes. what his name is yeah um so yeah, it's kind of got a slight kind of horror movie feel yeah. to it. It's a little eerie, uh, yeah. but then I think after those drums come in, it really kind of like changes the vibe of it all together. Yeah, and those drums are just so hard. Like I love the I love the sound of those drums. Like the first time I heard it, I was really not expecting it to be that like big. Yeah, like I'm just wondering if there's something like, like because in your music process now, it seems that like from from the the vibe of the newest record. Yeah. It's it's definitely a much more hip hop, more ambient, almost more electronic ish. Yeah. Um, it sounds like it's kind of like pulling away from um, pulling away from the live music instrumentation like aspect. Yeah. Um, like I know you there, said that you did put some on there for, of your own, but it's yeah. it's still based on sampling. It's still kind of like manipulation and, and electronic based. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I, that's part of it. Yeah. That is constructed obviously it's gonna change the, the feel of it, but uh, and there's some I, I feel like there's a little more swing in hip-hop generally um, right a little more bravado maybe in some of the play or like some of the structuring of like the sounds hmm. um, well so uh, would you prefer to make one or the other at this point or do you think you could still gotta go either way I, yeah I could do anything at any time really yeah my mind changes about music every day. I, I think the music I make on my own is kind of, in some ways, set. Like, it's all kind of around what I did on that Bell One album. Mm -hmm. um, but even the next one is maybe it has a little more rock in it, you know? And then the one after that maybe has a little more, like, ambient stuff in it. But they're all, like, around there. But I could definitely drop it tomorrow and be in a fucking Bad Brains cover band. Like, I don't, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's... Well, I, it's all great to me. It's all it's all music. This is just what I happen to be doing like alone. Right. I, it's easier to make. It's easier to make more ambient music by yourself. For one, I know. Mm. Um, and when you live in a house with like a wife and pets and stuff, you know, it, you make like aggressive rock based music in your house. And I don't have a band space, so yeah, you know, my surroundings kind of end up like dictating a lot about what what sounds i'm making too right yeah okay well that makes sense cool um i'll, I'll drop it right now if you want to start a fucking raging punk band 
What the 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 new album? You mean? Yeah, I'll I'll stop all my electronic music if someone will start a band with me. Dude, that that's been kind of like my my biggest gripe is being able to find like good and interesting musicians to play with. Really, and that that aren't uh, well, you know insane or inexperienced. You know, like when the world is done ending, we can get together and play some music. Okay, cool. That sounds great. I would I'd love to try it. So uh, let's get back into your uh, the record uh, introducing. Yeah, like I said, uh, this album is so so weird to me. I mean, like I like it. Um, I've been enjoying listening to it. I yeah. just feel like like you said to me the other night how it all kind of sounds like one track to you. You just kind of just listen to it like straight through and yeah, it kind of just seems like I don't. When, when you were saying something about song titles or, or whatever, and I was like, I don't know. I don't think I know any of these song titles. Like I kind of know them, you know, I know there is a song called Changeling, but until right. like yesterday when I kind of looked it up, I didn't know which one that was. Right. It was yeah. kind of all like an, an album I would put on in the background and just like draw or paint or whatever. And like, it was definitely like a mu mood music album that you just put on and it kind of like fills the space for a while. Hmm. Um, and songs do kind of blend into each other on it too. Like there's some songs where you don't really know if it, they, they've ended or, 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 or started, you know? Right. Um, my favorite song of the album is probably the next one after number song, um, Changeling, which I just mentioned. That's probably, that's why I mentioned it. That's probably my favorite one on it. I mean, like how, so how's Gavin doing? He's out in Oregon, isn't he? Gavin's in Oregon. He's releasing music like crazy. Um, some of his music is like really great. Um, and he just kind of like gets a job when he has to and like saves a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. He like leaves the job and makes music for a couple of years and then gets a job when he has to. And then he goes on tour and then it, it, he's living a very strange life, but it works for him. And, um, yeah, he's, he's good. He just put out a new record a couple of weeks ago. Oh, cool. Week. Heartbreaking, but it's a, it's, it's a great album. It's a great, it's a breakup album. So it's, it's just, I don't know. It's an honest, like adult breakup, breakup album, you know? Oh, really? Yeah. It doesn't pull any punches like on either side of the, the relationship. And it's, it's just really honest, like honest in a way that I'm like, I don't know how you could even be this honest, like on, on record, you know? Yeah. I would, never, I would have to decode that shit. <laughs> you know? in That's metaphor. Cool. But he's like straight up. Like, well, that's cool. I can admire yeah. that. I mean, and, and I'm always, uh, I'm always down for a, a sad song, so I'll that's give it a listen that. for sure. Now, how about your your thing that you were doing with Roman Rock? Uh, well, we haven't done much lately. Um, he had a, a child, um, and you know that monopolizes a certain amount of time. Sure um, does. When they were preparing for a child, we were working forever on that puppet video. Uh, and what was that called? Free verse video. It's called Free Verse. Okay. And um, yeah, so we were just like, we thought it would take us like a month. Ah, we'll just learn to make puppets. <laughs> we'll make a couple puppets, and then we'll like perform with the puppets. But it was like, seriously it took us like a year, may, maybe more. I think it took us a year. Yeah. Uh, at least half a year. It took forever. Um, just because of work and just we would get together and we'd like be like yeah we're gonna get this done and then we'd like set up one scene and then like start talking and then it would be like two hours later and we haven't done anything and both of us are a little bit like we're really motivated but but not necessarily willing to take charge at all times so right we finally got it done and it's funny it made a lot of people laugh reverse reverse Reverse. Quick question. Do you know how to finger paint? I don't do work for free unless it's for school. So don't try to say, yo, I thought we were cool. Just because you can't see the tools that we use, you assume I do the work free to pay dues. You wouldn't call a plumber when your sink breaks and expect the work done in exchange for a handshake. To make art, people watch it takes time. I expect to be compensated when you use mine. <laughs> Um, of yeah. all the things I've done in recent years, it was the thing I got the most like, "Hey man, this really brightened my day." Kind of vibe about. So yeah, it was, it was worth it. That's cool. Yeah, no, it's a great video. I watched it. Thanks. Um, it's something I, I need to share with my kids, see what they think of it, because um, they actually, my whole family actually liked your new record. 
Oh, nice. Because I put it on in the car as we, as we were taking a drive. And yeah. uh, my oldest kind of reacts to music. Like, he won't say he likes it. Um, so if you put something on, you just kind of have to see it, what he does with it. Read him, yeah. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I, I was driving, but I could kind of, like, get a little bit of the movement in the back, and I, and I, content, I can kind of catch something, some movement going on, some, like, nice. you know, rhythmic moving. I was just like, what's going on back there? You, you digging the music? He's just like, yeah, it's good. Nice. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, cringing and, like, hitting them all, like... Yeah, well, I, I, I've... It's not the first time I've said it, but uh, my, my kids don't like music. Like that, I don't know what's going on with them. That they don't really, at you know, all? as much as I play music around the house, and not even instruments. I mean, like just putting music on all the time. Like they never ask me about what I'm playing. They never ask me, like you know, like can I play something or can can you put something on for me or can you get me something? Yeah. Like they have no connection to like. I don't know, like popular music in general, which is kind of weird. I'm just like, because I've been trying to kind of immerse them in it ever since they were born, you know, it's just kind of like trying to make them little playlists that they can have on their little devices and say like, you know, okay, this is kid-friendly music, you know, get into this. Yeah. They never put anything on for themselves. Maybe that's why, because you're you're pushing it too hard. No, dad, no. I, no dad likes music too much. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta avoid this. Right. Well, now that, now they're at the, now that they're at the point where they can speak, I just talk to them and say like, hey, did you hear anything that you like? You know, and like the only thing that I've been able to make a connection with is the whole friggin' uh, Lil Nas X thing. Oh. The Old Town Road. Yeah, that was a big. Yeah. That, was, that brought the nation together. Oh, God. <laughs> but that, that's the one my kids would say, like, I like that song. It's just like, okay, like anything else though? Like, I mean, like, do you, like, you know his name, you know that song. Right. Any other songs you've ever heard of before in the world that, like. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah, I wonder how. I, see, I don't have children, so it would, it's really hard for me to even like fathom like a, a, my child not liking you, like something that means so much to me, like having no interest in it. Right. That would probably, like, yeah, that would that would do that would definitely do things to my brain. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I don't I don't push it on them, you know. But yeah, I I just right. try to get a vibe. I'm just like, what? Like, my, what my, are they interested in? Video games. That's. Kind of, kind of basically it you know like uh that and then like you know certain types of tv shows um yeah there's a certain amount of books that they they like but it's kind of like i don't know they're still finding themselves i guess and i, I just kind of i kind of just want to find out what they what you know what it is that interests them because i don't care if it's not music that's fine you right. know like just get into something though so that i can kind of kind of help you get into that direction you know yeah because the younger they start the better i really think you know for sure, yeah. Because you started playing music at what age? Probably like I don't, I don't really know, seven or eight, probably for piano lessons. Really? Okay, so that's pretty young. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I was always interested in music. It was just something I always definitely reacted well to. Music and art. I always wanted to draw, and I always wanted music around. So yeah, yeah. My kids are good artists, but they don't show any interest in music really. Well, art, you know, that's the thing. Oh, yeah. actually, um, my oldest got um, this thing. Um, I don't know if you know what it is. It's called a automaton. Don't know what that is. Automaton. It's. I think it's called a automaton. Automaton. It's uh, this weird Jap like Japanese or Chinese instrument. It is crazy, what and is it? it is like. Um, is it O T O? I mean, no, I think it's uh, A U T. Auto automaton or something like that. Um, so it kind of looks like a like a little Pac-Man thing on the bottom. I think it's basically a, a replica. Like it's supposed to be this instrument that looks like a musical note. So it's got okay. the big round end on the bottom, but it's got like a Pac-Man head, and then it's uh, this long shaft, and that's like the um, the finger pad. And you it, it kind of plays like a um, like a fretless bass almost. Oh, but it's weird. but it's all digital. So you squeeze the fucking Pac-Man's head to to kind of open up its mouth and it kind of like the mute the sound comes out of there. Yeah, so it's a cross between like a theremin and a and a stand-up bass or something. Kinda, yeah. yeah. It's weird. So, so it goes like, like that kind yeah, of stuff. You can do that, but I mean you can also just like, you know, finger notes and then like, you know, play whatever. And um if you look it up on YouTube, there's like some guy that does a bunch of different like song covers using that instrument. I gotta get this thing. It's only like thirty bucks. Yeah, it's not bad. 
Yeah, get you get the the biggest one the, because there's a couple of different like sizes. If you get the largest one, it kind of has a couple of different sound settings. Maybe I know what my next uh, my next album is going to be for you. Yeah, actually, it probably would well, go. It, it would go along well with the uh, Johnny Classic thing, I think. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I, w- I was playing around with that for a little bit, and so we had a little jam session with that. I played a ukulele, and he was playing his automaton. There you go. And um, so that was the, the breaking of the ice as far as music is concerned. So hopefully we can try to do a little bit more of that. You just had to, you had to find the weirdest instrument to play, <laughs> like, learn? I had to wait for them to fucking create it. I mean, like, yeah. I don't even know when that thing kind of hit the market. It's bizarre looking, man. It is. It's very bizarre. It's. Hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do more research on that. Okay. Yeah, look up the songs on YouTube, and you can uh, kind of like hear what people can do with it. I mean, it's pretty it's pretty miraculous, I think, as far as that like a single instrument creating all of these like different sounds and and so affordable. It's like that. That's one of the weird things. Like when we grew up at a time where everything was so, like, music making was so, like, cost prohibitive, you know, um, and especially recording it. Like, think about how hard it was for us to, like, record an idea, like, when you oh, yeah. I had, like, I would do, like, uh, pause tape things where you're, like, you have two, uh, two tape decks or whatever, oh, and you, right. like, play something into one, and then, like, you kind of pause it, and, play, and, like, so you're looping it in one, and then you try and play over it to get, like, some weird two-track action going on. Right. You know, recording two things into another uh, boom box or something. Yeah. Like, and now you just have a computer. It, the fucking computer comes with all the shit you need to make, like, literally a professional. People have made albums in GarageBand, you know, that have made millions of dollars. And yeah. It's great. It's, I, I, I'm glad, kind of, we had to struggle so much, but I also am very jealous that kids have it so easy with like, that stuff. I mean, they have yeah. it harder in, in a lot of other ways, but uh, if they want to make music, it's pretty damn easy. Yeah, no, they don't struggle at all. That, that's the, that's the dilemma of the of the new generation is that they they get everything that instantaneously. The struggle, but that is the struggle. That Fuck it's all that. There. That's not a struggle. The existential like problem, you know. I am going to ship my kids off to a, another cult, a kind of the country to let them see, you know, some some true struggling. See what it's like. You still have some Bolivian connections. Oh yeah. Yeah, there you go. Even if I didn't, I'd be like, "That's where you're going to go." Yeah. <laughs> You'll figure it out fast. <laughs> did you spend time there when you were a kid? I know your brother did. Yeah, right? my my brother spent more time than I did. I, I it was really weird because um, they like all of my brothers basically left the house at once. I have three older brothers and I'm the youngest. So yeah, um, my oldest got uh, this girl pregnant and he ended up living with her, so he moved out. Um, my other brother, who's a year older than me, Oscar, got a girl pregnant and my father shipped him away. To Bolivia for uh, for the remainder of the school year, and wow. um, then the following school year he actually went back to the school in Bolivia, and my the last brother in the house actually joined him for his final school year, Javi. Yeah, I remember I remember that. Right. Specific. So that last year, they both left at the beginning of the school year, and I was going to school by alone. myself. Yeah, you know, I was all alone, and it was it was tough for me because uh, I didn't realize that I actually loved my brothers at that point. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like the first day was great. It was just like, hey, I don't get beat up or toy tees anymore. This is awesome. And then like I was like, oh, I'm completely alone. This sucks. Yeah, that sucks. So um, we I went out there in like February, and it was great. It was a great experience. Uh, so I only spent I only spent like five months, I think. Yeah. Um, but the school cool. we, the school we went to was amazing. The kids we met were amazing. There were all these kids from all over the world. It's international yeah. school. Nice. Um, and we got to play some music out there, which was weird. Like, Why was it, what was weird about it? Just um, because we weren't very experienced. Like uh, we were very, very new to learning, especially me. Um, yeah. And uh, so we were just being like playing covers, you know, just okay. popular music uh, from the '90s at that time. Uh, we played at a um, a indigenous farmer's wedding by accident. By how by how by accident? Because we because my my grandfather owned land uh, in the countryside, and uh, so he would take us out there like for weekends which is the worst thing in the world it's like you want to talk about roughing it it's like there's no no electricity like you know adobe huts that type of thing you know picking fucking potatoes in a on a mountain right yeah not great um but so we were invited to this person's wedding these farmers campesinos and they had a band playing like what you can probably imagine what what a band might be playing in the countryside of bolivia and my grandfather 
What's that? More traditional music than what you guys are about to do? They they were doing some some covers too, but it was definitely like, you know, that style of music, the kind of mariachi-ish, or yeah. like kind of uh, cumbia cueca Latin music. Um, and yeah, my grandfather, for some reason, uh, was talking to some of the people like in the band or something, and it was just like, hey, my, my grandsons play music. You're like, can, can they... Would you mind if they play a song or two? And, and he's and they're like, yeah, of course, you know, for you, yeah, okay, yeah, we'll do it. Everyone's dream. <laughs> yeah. True. So my grandfather just hooked me up with a gig. And we have to play the songs that we know, which at the time were like, I think maybe we played like "Soul to Squeeze" by the Chili Peppers. Just because we were like, this is probably the most mellow song we know right now. Yeah. And. Good trying to figure out like the eq on this guy's like bass cab just like oh man what why like everything's like turned down like what the fuck is this guy doing like so i'm fiddling with all his knobs and we're playing and then it's a it's a harrowing experience because you yeah. could we could see them all looking at us being like why who are, are these guys and what are they doing right yeah like, why are they ruining my wedding <laughs> <laughs> but um but it's cool i mean uh so you never got to do any international gigging or what? Did you? No, no. It's like my biggest kind of regret. I, I really wish we could have done that. Um, I mean, I've been overseas a couple times in my life, but like not in that way. I feel like if you're in the right band and the right international tour, it can be a lot of fun, even if you're roughing it, you know? Right. You end up in such weird situations. I know from just all friends who have done it, you know, many people I've talked to about it. Uh, yeah, it's something I definitely missed out on. I feel like Ibu Gogo could have like done that well, um, but um, we just didn't weren't around long enough to get there. Yeah, yeah, because kind of prog based bands can do really well overseas still. From what um, I hear about, like any kind of band can do well over there if they're from the states. Too, yeah, and, yeah. So it's just like a different world, really. I did to see something new. Yeah, huh. yeah. American. And, and you guys never uh, got to release anything on vinyl either, right? No. I really wanted to do some of my stuff on vinyl, but just the cost, you know, I'm it's not expensive. making any money off the stuff. I'm not putting much into it. Uh, so, yeah, it, maybe someday. I mean, I would really like to, to do that. Even if it was just a, se a series of, like, seven inches or something, like, small. Hmm. Yeah, that's not bad. Old, I, you know. Yeah, I just looked into it. It's uh, not terribly expensive. Yeah. Not too bad. Yeah. I would love to do like a set of seven inches that's just, you know, like track, track, and like maybe five of them, like in a nice, like, design box or something, you know? Hmm. Someday. Okay. Well, okay. Something to think about. Yeah. Um, so, one other thing I was uh, kind of curious about, like, um, what what did happen with Groovy Small? Like, why did you guys disband? Um... I mean, it's a long story, but the short of it, I mean, or the semi-short of it, would be, um, it just, it just, we, we missed a couple opportunities that we had, or we, we botched them, and it, and I think that the uh, fallout from that kind of stuff was almost just like broke the the heart of the band. Oh, it got. We had opportunities to make things a lot better. A couple times, and we just, like I said before, I think we were, we, we thought we were too smart for them, and um, and then we were left in a spot where we like we couldn't progress, we couldn't find a booking agent, we couldn't, you know, our label just like gave up on us, and uh, mm. we were just all alone. So our last album is kind of like it's I it's my favorite group of small album. It's, it's called Maximum Unicorn, and it's yeah. really like a very like this band is giving up the album, but in a very good way. It's almost we, like the music almost stopped caring and we went back to, to some of our roots of like, uh, it's a little more aggressive and a little more playful. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you have that whole book theme too. <laughs> which makes absolutely no sense on purpose. It was almost like uh, trying to tie, we, we thought it would be funny to make like almost like a faux concept record that like, a reason to tie all these disparate songs together, uh, but it ends up not making any sense at all, which it doesn't, and it's fine, um, but it's funny. At that point, I think we really embraced our senses of humor again, like we stopped being serious about it because we knew it was basically over. Right. So we just had fun with that last 
record. Oh, okay. But it was really, it was just, you know, we had been doing it for 10 years and it was like we, we had hit a high point and it was like, okay, we have a chance to, 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 to make the next step and we just blew it. And uh, things kind of fall apart slowly yeah, after that. Right. Now that you're, you're saying that, uh, like, kind of blew it, was that because of the label thing with the Lakeshore? Uh, well, uh, we made the wrong choice. There, we had a few options besides Lakeshore. Like, there were some people who were kind of, like, courting us and, like, were trying to offer us, like, here, we'll kind of, like, nurture you into a major label deal. You just have to kind of, like, start thinking about music a little differently, which, of course, a major label is going to be like, we need to get some fucking songs that people can listen to. Right. Uh, and I think now, if someone put that on the table, I'd be like, yeah, like, hook me up with a producer. Like, good idea. Let's turn, like, what we can do into an actual, like, song, you know, that's someone right. listening. But when you're a kid, you think you know better, and you think you're, no. You didn't want to compromise. Well, the world is going to change for us. We're right. not going to change for the world, you know? Right. Uh, it's just, you know, so in that respect, like, we, 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 we took the Lakeshore thing because they were, like, jumped in once these other labels kind of had interest. I think they kind of, like, were like, ah, we, we'll, we'll say that we'll be, like, the artist's label. And it was totally, like, just a failed effort, you know, mm. all of our parts. So, because uh, I was curious about that, too, because when they, um, like, I don't know what happened with them exactly, but obviously you guys only did one record with them. Yeah, uh, contractually, you didn't have you weren't obligated to, to multiple records. I don't. I honestly do not even remember what okay. I signed. I yeah. was working at a pizza place, and like Gavin brought in the contract. He's like, "Sign this. This is our label deal." And I'm like, "Sure." Got a, I got a pizza in the oven. I'll sign it real quick. I did not read it. I have no idea what it said. I trust. We did have a lawyer, so I trust that it was like a semi fair deal. Yeah. But I I think it was just like for one record and some tour support. Like I don't think it was really a big deal. Yeah. And I remember from the very beginning. We, we were like, no, we're going to produce our, our own album. Well, we know what we're doing. Right. And, you know, we probably shouldn't have done that because it's okay, but it's it's producing an album the way we wrote songs. So it's like everyone has a say and all every snare drum sounds different in every part of each song. And it's, it's, it's kind of a mess, you know? Mm -hmm. Whereas live, I think there were moments where we really figured out what we were doing. I don't think we ever ever recorded ourselves that way if that makes any sense yeah well what i read online said that uh, you guys try to keep your audiences on your toes and kind of like changed up the songs live yeah we had a lot of fun live i mean gavin has like he has a, all he has a ton, a ton of stuff probably like boxes and boxes of videos and recordings um but it's so much work to go through them i can't blame him for not putting stuff online but one of the things that frustrates me about the band is that we have this whole career and this the stuff that's online is like really not representative at all of like what we were right live especially um but yeah we would do a lot of things where like we would just completely rewrite songs kind of for a one show you know and then that we'd have this completely different version of the show so a real uh, a, a, someone who really knew our music it would be exciting to see you every time because you they knew like you were going to change everything up for them you know and they would recognize the song, but then it would go somewhere else, and they would get excited about that. Hmm. And it was fun for us to not play the same thing over and over again. Um, right. Hopefully, I'd like to hear some of that stuff again, because I, sometimes when I do, I will get together with Gavin, and he'll play me like some show or some song, and I'd be, I will have completely forgotten that it ever even existed, you know? Right. Um, wow. Yeah, you guys had some crazy uh, bills, too, So because like, also online, kind of like, uh, there's some, some uh, list of, like, bills that you've uh, shared with cer certain bands yeah. um did you guys play with the chili peppers at one point we played uh the wbcn river rave oh okay it was a festival it's not like we opened for the red hot chili peppers right we played on the fourth stage <laughs> the same day yeah, in, at noon <laughs> <laughs> right so, but we were all technically on the bill with the Red Eyes Chili Peppers. Right. But you guys did have uh, a number of, like, opening slots for, for really good, uh, yeah. good national acts. Yeah, and sometimes, like, with uh, Incubus, you know, we, we caught them early on, and they kind of, like, were... Because they were so used to playing with, like, Deftones bands. Like, bands that were, like, corn cover bands or, like, Deftones cover bands, you know? And I right. think we 
they were like, wow, these guys are like so different. And so they kind of like, we hit it off with them. And so they would hook us up with shows every once in a while, even as they got bigger, like when, like if their opening act dropped off or something, they'd be like, hey, can you guys make it to Pennsylvania in the next week? You know, like shit like that. So they were really cool. And Mike, the guitar player from Incubus, like really tried to help us out when we were being very stubborn. Really? I, I always regret like not like, paying more attention to some of the stuff he tried to teach us. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Because I mean, they ended up kind of doing it right. I mean, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean. A functional band that kind of like tours and makes money playing music and, you know, has yeah. a following, built their audience, and they kept it. Right. Well, but, it, really ask. but it But there, there's that element of like, well, did they did they compromise their integrity? Like, whereas Groovis Malt didn't seem like you guys were willing to do that. I think that's Maybe I mean I don't I don't I don't know because they were really when we met them when they were kind of transitioning from like a, more of a, a heavier weirder band into kind of like a little bit more of like a pop or like songwriting band. Yeah, it was right after really, the SCE. Like it was legit. Like they wanted to do it. Like yeah. it wasn't like they were compromising themselves. Like they, they wanted to be a pop band. They realized it was fun to write songs with like a guitar player and a singer and then like bring that to the band and kind of you know work on the composition with everyone hmm. which was the exact opposite <laughs> you know everything we we thought we knew about music uh, well you guys yeah. just did it a different way that's all yeah we did it a different way yeah, you, <laughs> had, you had your own style lighter, uh, <laughs> lawyers and shit yeah yeah eric's a lawyer by the way did you know that no yeah what kind of lawyer he's a he's actually a decent lawyer <laughs> He's decent. Oh, well, that's he helps, good. Uh, he helps out with uh, with uh, landlords and shit. Like uh, I don't know what it, what exactly it's called. Uh, oh, like um, like real estate law, like. Uh... But on the side of the tenants. Oh, okay. Like, uh, uh, so, and like public interest law or something. You know, it's, it's something somewhat noble. Um, you know. It depends on what side of the fence you're on, really. <sighs> <I guess. laughs> I think I think it's noble. It sounds noble. No, no, I I I I do agree with that. I'm just saying because I used to no. be a, a property owner, so you oh, know, okay. Eric oh, yes. would be a guy I would not want to hear from. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I get it. And get, yeah, Gavin was having some problems with tenants recently, so he probably wouldn't wouldn't have liked Eric too much. Yeah, if um, you if you own property that you rent, you most likely run into some problem at some point. <laughs> it's almost inevitable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but um, I yeah, I, I often wonder like if um we've had offers to like get back together and like do a like kind of reunion show and we've thought about it, but I, you know, I, I can't really imagine if we were small ever getting on stage and playing at this point. Really? <laughs> Not really. I just feel like we've aged out of it so hardcore. Um, I, it just seems like it would be silly to me. Hmm. If we really picked and choose, chose songs, like maybe we could structure something that would make sense uh, with our current brains and bodies. Right. Uh, but, Huh. Uh, yeah. Well, I think it'd be interesting. Um, I, I'd be there for sure. Um, I think that I think a lot of people would probably be there. Yeah, we could probably we could probably fill one room or one night at some point. Like. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, we'll we'll try it because then you know then if you see that the uh, you know the the uh, attention is a little bit better than you're expecting, then you know maybe just add on to it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Who knows? Well, we're literally, in everyone is in. Besides me and Scott McPhail, everyone is in a different state. So uh, there's no, would not be. That's one of the main issues. It's like same with Ibu Gogo. It's like I would totally get that band back together in a second. But I'm here. Justin's in North Carolina and Gavin's in Portland, Oregon. So it's like there's no possible way to do it. Mm. It's the same. The small. It's like two dudes in New York City. Gavin's in Portland. Scott's here. Um, you know. Just yeah. Like, wouldn't work. Yeah, no, I guess like it makes sense. So you're working on new albums for this solo project. Let's just call it solo project, right? Yeah, that, that works. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, when I released that first Bell One album, it was supposed to be one of a series of I think six albums. It was all the music I started in my 30s and never finished, and I was planning on releasing it in my 40th year, and I just you know, blew it and I released one and I couldn't finish the other one. So I'm still planning on doing the rest, but it's just, you know, it, life is, keeps getting in the way. Yeah. Uh, I was telling you, like, I had just kind of like 
gotten back into the swing and I was like recording every weekend and like making a lot of like headway and then my the, my roof started leaking in my studio area and so we, I had to like take my entire studio down and like throw it in the basement so they could repair the roof and then repair the, the ceiling and all that shit which is happening now this yeah. week it was like as soon as you get stuff rolling again it's like life just kind of punches you in the face mm-hmm. uh, but it's okay that stuff will get finished and you know I, I, I'm, I'm glad I have like a few people here and there like asking me like when's the next thing coming out you know it's nice but um, I just not like I have people like banging on my door for it so I don't feel like guilty about not finishing it right it's more of a personal thing at this point. I really want to. I want. I've worked on so much music that never has seen the light of day. That I really just want to get it out so I can like start the next thing and have like a clean slate. You know, that's right. more of what, like cleaning that slate. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, I can get that done. So, what, what you don't you don't have a projected as like an estimated time that you think maybe the second record will be done by? I don't know. I mean, I might even. I mean, might put other things out before that like there's there's a couple more like beat tape things like more standard hip-hop uh instrumental beat uh, oh, okay. albums i have uh, and those might even come out before the next like proper bell album that falls into the same like group of music or same like five like there's like a computer full of a hard drive full of music and those are on there as well if i come out sooner i would say a year there will be some new music but i really have no idea hmm. okay you know how it is. I don't know, man. I haven't even been making music like at all lately. Like exactly, you know how it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny for for me too. It's like the rec. I was trying to say it the other day, and I don't know what the right way to say it is. Is that the record? When I got the record, the situation I was in means more to me than the record itself. So the play, the the part the record played in my life when I got it means more to me than the music does today. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Just well, what it did to my brain and what it led me towards afterwards with sampling and even just like appreciating jazz more or appreciating like random like shit you find in the record store more. Like it just opened me up to something else, I guess is what it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's why I hold it in such high, high esteem. But I, other people like it's, I'm not alone. Like, but I hold it in high esteem more for very personal reasons as opposed to what is like the music on the album. Right. So do you mean like, uh, especially like where you got it and who you were with at the time like that? I think so. Yeah. I think it, it, yeah, I think so. Um, like I said, I was in New York and, um, I, I was in a suite. So it was like with me and three other guys, we were all very different people but we all had certain tastes that kind of like overlapped. And this album was one of those things that kind of everyone could listen to. Mm. Um, but one dude was like straight up into hip hop. One guy was like indie rock and Bowie guy. One guy was like more into reggae and jazz. And we all got along really well, probably because we just smoked a lot of weed and we're making art all the time, you know? Um, yeah. But this album kind of like brought all, they bridged all that shit together. But it also then, like I said, led into other things. Like it led me to go into one of the other guy's rooms who had a sampling keyboard and like learn how to sample and make beats with him, you know? Hmm. And that was the time I ever did that, you know? And that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't kind of like hooked onto this album. Right. Uh, so it's just like, a, it, that was just three months of my life where like so much happened, just taste making stuff, you know? Right. Brain, brain switch flipping stuff that like, you know, I wouldn't know what, about Chicago post rock and like tortoise and stuff if I hadn't gone there. You know, I wouldn't know about so uh, Samande. I wouldn't know about like all these bands and all this stuff if I hadn't just been in that space for three months. So yeah, it's just me lot to be, and this record is a big, big part of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, it was great talking to you. Uh, we can do it again sometime if you ever want to talk about music. You don't have another guest. I can be your fall guy. I love to talk about music. Oh yeah. Okay. Do it at any time. Well, I'm glad that we could just, you know, reconnect because it's just been so long, man. And uh, and I'm just happy to know that, that I can actually reach out to you and, and that you'd be willing to do that. I'm here. That's and if you want to play music, I'm probably here as well. Okay. I mean, yeah. that would be a, a great honor for sure. Cool. I would love to. Cool. Cool, Brandon. Well, thanks, man. Thanks for doing this again. And uh, yeah. yeah, I'll be in touch soon. Yeah, stay in touch. All right, man. Have a good night. Take it easy. You too. Take it easy.